This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Today, we're talking with Peter Moses, co-founder of Mighty Oak Roasters in Astoria, New York. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. Uh, today is Founder Friday, and we are talking with the co-founder of Mighty Oak Roasters in Astoria, New York. I'm really excited to share that with you. Great conversation. I uh, got to talk with Peter live in their uh, cafe in Astoria, and uh, we got we cover some really cool stuff, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So now, if you have not yet subscribed to the show, please uh, go ahead and do that by hitting the subscribe button wherever you get this podcast, whichever podcast playing service you use, and you'll never miss an episode. Also, I want to draw your attention to the uh, news that Keys to the Shop has created a private community for Keys to the Shop listeners like yourself to get together and uh, talk all things shop and leadership, management, operations, things like that, help each other out with ideas and solutions. It's really growing fast, and I really want you to be a part of it. So if you follow the link in the show notes to the Keys to the Shop Mighty Network, um, it's on the platform Mighty Networks, and uh, just send me an email, chris at keys to the shop.com, or just follow the link in the show notes. And uh, yeah, so today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers. Uh, if you've got commercial coffee equipment needs, then this is the company that I think you need to partner with because not only do they have an amazing selection that they curate from all over the world, but they work really hard to make sure that you're going to get the exact right equipment for your context, for your situation, whether that's grinders, brewers, espresso machines, or even things like under-counter refrigeration. They are definitely the type of people that you want to be working with for your commercial coffee equipment projects. So find out more information by going to prima-coffee.com. Peruse the website, see what they have to offer. Um, learn a lot too, because they have a lot of great free resources on their website to help you make great coffee. And really facilitating your success in specialty coffee is what they're all about. So again, that's prima-coffee.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series from Pacific. The Barista Series is the world's leading line of plant-based performance beverages because not only is it designed for the professional barista, but it's designed right alongside the feedback of professional baristas so that when it does hit the shelf, when it's released, you know it's going to perform on the bar spectacularly. So no matter if you're choosing the almond, soy, hemp, coconut, rice, or oat milk, you will have a product that stands up the heat from steaming, produces amazing latte art ready texture, and keeps the flavor balance of the beverage focused on the coffee, which is super important. So I highly recommend that you get this in your store, try it out for yourself, and I think you're really going to like it. Go to pacificfoods.com, follow the link in the show notes in order to go to the food service section of their website, and uh, see how the Barista Series from Pacific can really help elevate the plant-based offerings in your store. All right, so today I'm excited to present to you a conversation that I had with the co-founder of uh, Mighty Oak Roasters in Astoria, New York, Peter Moses. Peter and his business partner, Sean, opened Mighty Oak Roasters in 2019. And you might remember Peter from the episode uh, 142, Entrepreneur Interviews from Coffee Fest New York. That was back in March of 2019. They are right in the middle of the build-out phase of Mighty Oak Roasters and got to watch the progress via Instagram. And now a year later in March, was able to sit down with Peter again, this time in the offices of the Mighty Oak Roasters headquarters in Astoria. And it is quite a beautiful cafe. It is extremely well designed. All of the roasting and production is done in the cafe um, and the cafe itself is laid out really fantastically. It's a thousand square feet, but it doesn't feel cramped. It's amazing uh, the, the work that's gone into this. And they've quickly become the place for great coffee in Astoria, um, serving that community very well. And we get to talk with Peter about the uh, build out, kind of what happened since our last interview, which we'll link to that interview uh, 142 in the show notes here. But um, what's gone on since then? What was what were some of the challenges in the build out? We're going to talk about wood fire roasting. We're going to talk about hiring and uh, leadership, management, um, growth, organic growth, and their philosophy and business. Now, this interview was recorded 
before everything just started to get shut down. So I was at Coffee Fest in uh, New York in March. I'm really glad I got to sit down with Peter. But, um, you know, I still want to air this interview because it's a great conversation. It's a great company doing amazing work. They're still roasting. Uh, they just came out with a great collect collaboration with a local beer uh, company, and they're still doing great things. So without further ado from me, why don't we get right to the interview? Here now is my conversation with the co-founder of Mighty Oak Roasters, Peter Moses. So here we have Peter Moses, a Mighty Oak Roasters, Astoria, New York, New York. Um, how's it going? It's going well, and yourself? Oh, it's going great. Um, I just got the tour of your space, and it's incredible. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, it's what you said is a thousand square feet. Just about, yeah. Yeah, nine fifty, something like that. You've got the roasting and the you got all the operations that are there in the cafe. Yeah, all the production, all of the the service. It, it's really impressive the way that you designed it to fit everything in there. It doesn't feel cramped. Thanks. Yeah, my partner Sean and I spent many, many hours working through layout. When we last talked, it was Coffee Fest, and I think that was a year ago, um, pretty much. And you're getting ready to, you weren't at the point of opening, but you were kind of in the midst of build out. Uh, I know you had a space. And what take us through what happened after that point um, to get you to the open um and and what day that or what month what uh when was it, was the open date sure um uh, our soft opening was may 17th mm -hmm. our grand opening was all the way uh the next day on may 18th <laughs> we uh quickly needed to open just to you know get things up and running and uh have money start to come in instead of just go out uh and it was you know kind of the right time for us before memorial day weekend which was the following weekend uh, when we talked last, it was March, so I guess we were about two months out from opening, um, yeah, but we were at that point 12 months into our build-out, so we had about a 14-month build-out, wow. which was about 11 months longer than we had initially planned. <laughs> uh, well, tell, well, tell me about that. What? Why was that? Uh, well, the space we took over um, was previously a pizza, uh, pizza shop, and it had been so since, I think, the mid-80s. And um, you could tell there, you know, it's kind of like uh, um, fossils and you dig down in the earth and you could see the different colors of the rock. We had that with the pizza grease. Um, <laughs> you could just say, oh, this was mid 90s. And, uh, you know, here's some, uh, you know, Mountain Dew mixed in and, you know, here's some old employees that got yeah. trapped in the, in the sedimental layer, layers. So, yeah, it was uh, we had to do, you know, a f entire, you know, full gut reno. We took uh, um, everything down to the bare bones we went down to the joists on the floor so you know you could at one point um get to the basement very fast <laughs> if, if, if you you know oh. if you needed to so um there was just layers and layers and layers of flooring and concrete we took out um i think we did the math it was forty thousand pounds of debris from the space not including um any equipment or what we metal that we had taken to the scrapyard um, so it was just lots of stuff. Um, and, you know, we found problems. We found, a, like, there was an electrical panel that had been drywalled over that was live, that, like, just fire hazards. <laughs> uh, we found evidence of not one but two grease fires in the space that had been covered up that, you know, even the landlord didn't know about. Um, so we just really, you know, there was a lot of work that had to be done. Uh, we wanted to make sure this place was safe and warm and welcoming and, you know, a place people would want to come to because, we knew that uh, if it wasn't a comfortable space, people wouldn't wouldn't come and stay, or they'd come and you know and visit, but maybe not come back. Um, so you know, that we gave a lot of thought to that. So as you were discovering all of these things about the space, did it change what you originally had planned for it? It sure did. I mean, we discovered that there was a brick wall on you know one side, so you know it had been covered up uh, with uh, you know drywall, and uh, we spent you know couple of weeks grinding it with a you know an angle grinder and a um, brass uh, wheel brush to like take off the gunk and clean off the brick and then you know did a you know a ceiling on it a sealant on it um, we didn't know that brick wall was going to be there so you know it was a happy find and said okay well now this wall is not going to be mm -hmm. painted or it's not going to be drywall um, there was a oh look here's a window that was bricked up 
great, we have another window in the space, so even some more light. Um, so it's just kind of one of those things, you know, we spent a lot of time in the space getting a feel for the space, if that makes sense. You know, it would kind of, we didn't want to try to cram our vision to make it fit. We wanted to work with the space to mm. be the best space that it could be, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, yeah well, it totally makes sense because you would, it, it just wouldn't feel right, I guess, if you tried to shoehorn it in, right? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it definitely wouldn't be, you know, if I did another space or, if, you know, John and I built something else out somewhere else, it wouldn't necessarily look the same as far as the layout and the flow and all that stuff. You know, I some places you go and they use a cookie cutter layout and um, into different size or shaped spaces. And, you know, it just doesn't feel right always. Mm -hmm. Well, you're always compromising. So at some point, your vision for the space is going to be uh, based on the people you're going to serve. And y your first guess at what's ideal is usually... I mean, I wouldn't say wrong, but, you know, you're going to learn from it. Uh, so w as you're building this out, I know that you and Sean did a lot of the work yourselves uh, in the space. Like, what? take me through a little bit of this, the way you decided which things to outsource and which things to take on yourselves. Sure. Um, money <laughs> was the big oh, deciding yeah. factor, yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> I know we're probably the first uh, people to say that. Um, you know, my business partner Sean you know he wasn't able to be here today unfortunately uh, he was supposed to be on the podcast uh, with us uh, but he actually got invited to go to Columbia um, to best of Kauka uh, he is judging some coffee and he's down there for the auction and it's his first trip to origin um, so we'll let it pass yeah we'll let we'll give him a pass on this one for sure um, but he's a uh, you know an insanely talented individual and that's you know one of the reasons that uh, I knew we would be able to work well together he um, has an amazing eye for design uh, and um, carpentry. And, you know, so he built the cabinets. He built the benches. He built the countertops. You know, he uh, did a lot of the framing out on that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we laid all the tile in the space. Uh, I did the generic white tile. You know, a lot of that Sean and I did in the back. Uh, Sean and, you know, uh, his partner and our designer, Mab, and couple of the, their friends laid the main tile in the space, you know, concrete tile that's like, uh, you know, patterned and, uh, yeah. you know, it's it was going to be, thank you. It was going to be, uh, you know, seven or eight grand to have someone install just that tile. And we we're like, well, that costs, you know, seven or eight grand that we don't have to spend on this, you know, because again, our build out took a lot longer than we had anticipated. Part of that was for, you know, getting the roaster and the certification of the roaster, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's not UL listed. It didn't, doesn't come off the line. There's not a there's two wood fired roasters um, in the Americas, so you know we had to have Intertech come out um, and you know certify the roaster and do heat testing and all that kind of stuff before we could you know get some of the permits for the space. Wow. So and and that was uh, one of the main things that I was just in awe of. Uh, you were describing some of what that entails the the wood fire roaster. Um, and Sean had been wood fire roasting coffee before he had Mighty Oak yep. started. And we talked about that in our first interview a little bit. Sure. Um, but then you've upgraded to this uh, new machine, mm -hmm. uh, I imagine. It, it's not something that he was using before. Um, no, he, he started, you know, uh, cast iron skillet in his backyard over Weber Grill. <laughs> um, and I think did some air popper. And then uh, he fabricated or had a drum fabricated that he hooked up to a variable speed motor um, that, you know, cylindrical drum uh, over more of a barrel grill and, you know, was roasting with lump hardwood charcoal uh, and wood. Um, he moved up to a gas roaster and he just didn't, you know, uh, like like it as much. You know, there was different different kind of feeling. Uh, he, you know, he's done a lot of woodwork all his life and he has a very close connection to wood uh, in that regards. And... You know, there's things that you can do with the, the wood fire that you just can't do with a gas roaster, such as, you know, pair a different type of wood with a coffee. You know, the same coffee roasted with two different types of wood is going to taste different. Really? Yeah. The uh, aromatics uh, from the oils in the wood impart, you know, a subtle flavor on it. Um, one story I like to tell is, you know, I think early on, Sean was roasting, you know, four batches of uh, coffee and, you know, it's cupping them the next day and batch two tasted different and you know, he goes into Artisan and looks in the graphs are the same and it's, you know, the same bag of coffee. Like there's, you know, real no reason why it should taste different. And 
what he figured out is that, you know, in the mixed hardwood, uh, there was some cherry and he had thought he had pulled it all out, realized, you know, one piece of cherry must not have looked quite as cherry as all the others. And uh, okay. there was some deductive reasoning, realized that cherry was in that, you know, one batch and it changed the flavor of the coffee. Didn't make the coffee bad. You know, it's still really good. But, you know, for uh, consistency's sake, that became, you know, a donated batch, didn't go out on the shelves, didn't, you know, didn't didn't mm. go through the shop. I, it, and this is a bit of a rabbit hole, so forgive me, because I still I still want to kind of go in uh, linearly <laughs> sure, to, sure. to you know opening the shop and everything. So we'll get back to that. But um, as you know, I've told you, I've been working on a sustainability series um, yet to be released. But um, you know, one of the one of the things that you could say about this is like one of the main selling points is that it is very sustainable. Um, and not a lot of people would recognize that when they look at a wood fire roaster because well, you're burning wood and it doesn't isn't that bad because you're creating smoke and you know, all this other stuff. Explain a little bit about why roasting this way is more sustainable and how you've kind of tricked out this uh, system to be able to or rigged up this system to be able to make it even more so. Yeah, um, well, we're not digging our fuel out of the ground it's not been trapped underground for you know eons or you know it's a new cycle carbon so not too long ago this tree was you know carbon in the ground or carbon in the air and then you know the tree captures it and uh we're just kind of releasing it you know if that tree had fallen down and you know rotted out that carbon would have been released back into the air you know relatively quickly um so like that's kind of the main thing is you know we don't have to you know, there's no fracking involved uh, for, you know, this uh, <laughs> this roaster. We don't use an afterburner. Uh, we don't use gas to burn the air. We use uh, uh, electrostatic precipitators. Um, we have a two-battery system. Um, we're able to, you know, pull all the, any particulate matter out of the air. Basically a high-voltage mix between a bug zapper and a Dyson air room cleaner. You know, you wipe the blades off and all the... You, all that gunk, and you're like, oh, that was what was in the air? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we vacuum it out, and then we run them through the dishwasher. So uh, that stuff doesn't go into the air. We're not, you know, forcing our neighbors to breathe, you know, coffee fumes or coffee uh, junk, you know, in their lungs. Um, and then we have a carbon filter. It's, I think, 100 or 150 pounds of carbon pellets, and that takes all the smell out of the air. So you can't tell that we're roasting from, you know, necessarily across the street. Um I can tell when there's, you know, there's a production roaster about a mile and a half away, and I can tell when they're roasting. Yeah. Because, the, you know, they free aspirate. Well, that's pretty important in New York City. I mean, there's been, you know, cases in New York where roasters have actually, large roasters have actually had to move their entire operations uh, from Manhattan to Brooklyn. And there's like a famous uh, coal pizza place that had to move to, uh, from Manhattan over to Brooklyn a, a while ago, I forget. I went there a long time ago. It's like yeah. a famous wait in line forever type of place. But it, it's really cool that you're able to just kind of in, almost incognito roast coffee in the middle of uh, Astoria. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can smell it, you know, obviously with the windows open and, you know, that kind of stuff just from mm -hmm. the from the machine itself or if you're in the cafe because, you know, we roast right there. It's right out in the open. So, um, you know, we roast during business hours because that's when you need to roast. Um, you know, it's not a secretive, you know, hide it type of thing. Um, we, you know, we have the DEP out and they come out and do an inspection. You know, they were on the roof and they said seven feet away from the output. They couldn't smell either the, the, the wood fire or from the coffee roasting because they, you know, tested both separately, you know, just the fire and then also while we're roasting coffee. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it feels good to know that we're not, you know, polluting in the air and, you know, uh, making the, you know, air quality worse than it needs to be. Yeah, absolutely. And and the idea of wood being a renewable resource also, um, and I don't think a lot of people realize that uh, if done the right way, growing trees after cutting them down is, is one of the most green things you could do as far as fuel is concerned. Yeah. And, that, you know, the wood that we get, it's from, you know, uh, managed forests, you know, a lot of blowdown. Uh, that kind of stuff. So it's not, they're not, you know, out there clear cutting, you know, beautiful <laughs> forest you know, for us to make our, you know, specialty coffee. It's like, no, this is from, you know, within the tri-state area, you know, not too far away. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it kind of makes, uh, it makes the environment better. You know, we don't need a forest fire to come through and, you know, take it all down. You know, you really want to manage those forests and, 
make sure the dead wood is brought out um, and we're able to use something that uh, otherwise would just rot. That's awesome. Um, so when we're talking about the flavor imparted, because you said it changed the like the oils in the wood impart a flavor to the coffee, and part of me just cringed a little bit, sure. so I, if I'm being honest. Yeah, because I have that effect. Yeah. <laughs> we, I, I think because we have this um, trope, I guess now, in coffee of getting out of the way of the coffee, letting the coffee shine, and um, – no matter what, and I, I tend to be of more of this mindset nowadays, that your roasting is going to affect what kind of flavors the coffee is showing to the consumer. And so based on the kind of roaster that you choose and the cycle that you have that coffee on and the airflow and all that stuff, it's going to change the way the coffee tastes. It, you're going to taste roast in every roasted coffee because it's roasted coffee, right? Yep. So... But when you're talking about um, adding it, how do you find the balance between letting the coffee shine uh, for its origin characteristics and then the impartation of flavor? Is it as extreme as the way you're describing it? Like, it, oh, this is definitely oak or um, cherry. I will say this may be a cop out, but I have no idea. That's really, you know, Sean handles all of that he does you know all of the sampling all of the green bind he yeah. does the test rows let's call him right now so yeah i would say you know <laughs> i promised i wouldn't uh, message him on slack but i, I didn't say i wouldn't uh, call him for a podcast yeah. so <laughs> well, he, you know while he's away um yeah you know it, you said you know letting the coffee shine through and actually i mean we feel that that's what we are doing mm -hmm. you know we can kind of you know enhance those flavors in the coffee and it's you know we're not using any kind of flavored agents or anything like that. You know, I mean, it really is letting that coffee shine through. Um, so, you know, we don't roast with like a million different types of wood, you know, do a lot of apple, a lot of maple, a lot of mixed hardwood. Uh, finally, our, our wood guy has, you know, been able to get us some oak now, you know, it was for a while we weren't getting any oak. Um, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, come on now. Welcome, you know, <laughs> It's not Mighty Cherry. No, it's it sure isn't. <laughs> that that name was taken. Um, no. Uh, so yeah. So you know, with the uh, the different woods, um, it's a Sean thing and his his sensory okay. and his taste. And you know, I won't pretend to uh, give an answer where I don't know. Well, what I've tasted has been delicious. So thank just, you. Just for what it's worth. I, and I think again, going back to the idea, if you're using um, some people, you know, using an air roaster, some people using um old like 1901 royal roaster you know, cast sure. iron roasters and uh the all the parts in between right so we are imparting something to the coffee and like i said it was really delicious and um it it, it does seem like a, a uh really craft way to to roast the coffee like to to um, be in tune with what the coffee is doing and there's a difference in roasting and i'm asking another roasting question i guess so feel free to cop out of this one too i, I cop out <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you were explaining no. to me a little bit about how it's like you you have to really commit to it when you're adding fuel and you're adding like oh yeah for sure when you're roasting on another type of roaster you can turn the gas off that's right but you can, there's no off no we've looked there's no uh there's no off button on the fire <laughs> yeah so um, you know, you have to, uh, commit, uh, to, you know, if you want to really need to raise a temp and you can't get to what you need just through adjusting airflow, if you're going to put on another piece of wood, you know, then it's going to make the fire hotter and, you know, you're going to have to uh, commit to that mm -hmm. and make that decision. And, you know, that's the, the testament to Sean's skill and, um, our production roaster, Jake, and, you know, their ability to kind of feel what's going on and, you know, they're using, um, you know, software and they're, you know, t uh, crafting out the time and the temp and all that stuff. But it's uh, you can't push the button and let the profile run and come back and uh, have some roasted coffee. You have to you have to pay attention to it. It's also it's a fire in a space. And, you know, there it's a building in New York City. And, you know, uh, there's a responsibility of, you know, making sure that, you know, you don't burn down the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Not we, that it, it is. It's very safe. I feel like I feel like we all have that responsibility <laughs> sure, sure. in some way to not burn our neighborhoods down. So we um, let's get out of the roasting. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Clear of that. So um, you uh, opened in May. And when you opened, um, after all after all the build out and adjusting for what the space presented you, um, 
what was the initial response in the community to your open? Finally, <laughs> was I think the initial response. You know, it was a long time to to mm. open, um, but yeah, it's been a really great response. We have um, some people who have been here almost every single day since we've been open. Um, we have, you know, it's a majority of repeat customers coming in every single day. Um, there was, you know, still get new people in, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's been great. We, uh, the feedback is just, you know, so good. Um, we have a lot of people who work from home, uh, and you know, our cafe is their second home or their, you know, I, I yeah. won't say third place, but you know, third place or whatever. Yep, there you go. Yep. Oh, I did it. Sorry. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, people love the coffee. They love the, they love the space. They love the feel of it. Um, you know, the, the one complaint we ever you know, really get is, you know, it's too busy. It's too crowded. There's too many people here. And it's just like, but Hey, it's a business. But you live in New York too. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> like, there's people everywhere. Yep. But so, yeah, well you have all these regulars and they're experiencing your, your coffee and your drinks. Like, uh, it, yeah, imagine, you know, that response finally, um, you're serving a community that seems like it might have been underserved at, at that point that you would open. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, the avenue that we're on, there wasn't really any good coffee. You know, you could get that dirty penny water, you know, bodega coffee. Uh, you know, you need to add a lot of milk and a lot of sugar to make it palatable. Um, but there was not, you know, especially coffee around here. There's some stuff, you know, an avenue this way, an avenue the other way, um, but not to the level that uh, I believe that we're executing on. So, um, we also open pretty early. There's a lot of film production uh, in New York City. A lot of those people live in Astoria, and they may have those, you know, six, you know, 7 a.m. call times, 6.30 a.m. call times, and uh, sometimes you couldn't get a cu good cup of coffee early in the morning. And so that was also part of the reasoning, uh -huh. you know, why we're here and, you know, the, even just the hours that we're open. Why open a cafe instead of just a roasting facility that – gains a lot of wholesale like get the roaster that you have now get a warehouse space not deal with the you know 12 month build out and grease fire you know crime and yeah. <laughs> whatever um new york city's laws really so we can be a roaster in a commercially zoned space if we have an on-site cafe if we were just roasting we needed to be in an industrial zone mm. and industrial zones while uh, less expensive per square foot Generally, the space is going to be a lot larger, and we knew it was going to take time to ramp up the wholesale. So the idea was that the cafe would pay for the space, pay for the business, uh, while we grow those other facets of the business. Interesting. And a lot of people are doing co-roasting spaces. There's one in Red Hook here, mm -hmm. um, you know, Pulley Collective. Yep. Um, Regalia, not too far from here. Okay. I didn't know about that. Um, but you, uh, uh, they don't have wood roasters. <laughs> At those they don't. coasting spaces, so you have to do this. That's right. Yeah, and uh, you know we can't go roast somewhere else uh, if you know something happens. Uh, the other one of these machines is uh, in Vermont, and so that's a little bit of a drive for us. It's mm -hmm. about you know uh, four or five hours away, um, and it's a machine Sean actually got to use and practice on before we pulled the trigger on, oh, on ordering nice. this. Yeah, so he spent I think a couple weeks up there. Um, it, it seems to be more of a toy for them uh, rather than a production roaster. Um, but, you know, he was able to work on the machine and then, you know, talk to the uh, the engineers and say, you know, hey, what about this? Or can you can you make this thing work? And so we really did get a, you know, kind of a one of one of a kind customized machine. But, yeah, it's uh, you know, we've had people ask, hey, can we come and, you know, roast here? And, you know, it's not been something that we've been open to just again. Um, don't want a stranger off the street starting, you know, starting a fire in our space. And, you yeah. know, uh, it's a it's a different animal for sure, from what I understand that, you know, uh, the transition from a gas roaster to a wood fired roaster is not the same as going from one gas roaster to another, which is, you know, can have its own difficulties as it is. Sure. Wow. Another yeah. world. I'll yeah. bet. So um, neither you or Sean had barista experience before coming into this or or just like significant coffee experience is that correct yeah i mean sean uh his family had an espresso machine they still do at their house so he started you know pulling shots when he was sure. 11 or okay. 12 so yeah. he started drinking coffee quite early um though neither of us had uh, worked in a coffee shop okay um and you know i was commenting on how 
well thought out the back bar design was as you were giving me the tour because you know it, and the question was well you hadn't had this experience and so you kind of like thought through a lot of those things with other people too uh that, sure. to give you feedback but as owners who didn't have experience you were still able to like put it together fairly well in, because you put a lot of thought into it instead of coming at it from a really uh a lot of owners have an assumptive view like oh this will fit here so i'll just put it there and they never give it a second thought but so why why put all that effort into the workflow um if you didn't necessarily need to because a lot of people don't well i i don't think you ever don't need to i just think some people don't do what they should be doing and <laughs> making sure it flows yeah um you know i want to sell a lot of coffee and i need to make it easier for you know our baristas to do so and i don't want them tripping over themselves or having to walk five you know five steps to you know grind coffee for the portafilter and five steps back to put it in the machine um you know we have friends who uh you know are baristas and who've managed coffee shops and um you know we would just show the plans to everybody and you know with the build out you know we knew where the counter was going to be but we had flexibility on where we were going to move you know where things would be mm -hmm. so you know we drew it out we I, I think i don't know if we at one point cut out pieces of cardboard or we taped it out and you know uh, on the floor and said oh, you know, this smart. is where things are going to be and mm -hmm. you know trying to decide how much space between here you know i think we added two inches of space between the front counter and the back counter um because it felt a little tight originally um nice. and you know we did do some of those adjustments and we visited a lot of places we did a lot of research <laughs> i drank a lot of espressos and you know That's getting fun. coffees at other places you know just to see like where were their pain points and you know talk to just you know other strangers and shops and say hey what do you like about this what do you wish you know was different with your shop yeah. because um you know someone in the middle of a shift is going to have some really uh succinct thoughts about you know what they do and don't like been uh, thinking about it for a while yeah <laughs> <laughs> at least, you know several hours at least you know yeah well, that's good. I mean, again, that, that's like above and beyond, I think, in, in terms of what a lot of people do. So I'm glad that you all kind of took that uh, approach to it because, you know, well, your baristas are even more glad, I bet. Yeah, I, they uh, they seem pretty happy, especially the ones who've, you know, uh, worked in other shops. And, you know, they, they know the difference and they see the, you know, the kind of the care that was put into it. So now the thought of building a space is one thing. The thought of the thought of managing people is another and being in that position to be the boss and, and like deal with the hiring and onboarding and all that stuff. How has that played out compared, you know, like compared to what you thought might be your reality in the HR side and to what is now? Yeah. Um, with the build out, you know, you, you make a dis mistake and you know, where something's going to be and you're going to have to live with that. For a long time, um, hopefully the mistakes that we're making with people don't have those kind of impacts. You know, yeah. hopefully they're not you know anything like that severe. I do find new ways to make mistakes. Uh, you know, with people um, every day, probably. You know, it's one of the things. You know, I'm always you know uh, trying to learn from those mistakes. And um, you know, we have a pretty robust you know onboarding and hiring process. Um, stolen a lot um from colin Harmon, his book uh what i know about running coffee shops yeah um we do you know an online questionnaire to kind of weed out some of the people um do phone screens i'm gonna do an in-person interview with myself myself and our cafe manager jake and then we do some training shifts and you know see how people are on bar but more about how they interact with customers and how they interact with um you know the rest of the staff mm -hmm. and We've had people we've brought in for training shifts who, you know, we it's, it's not a good fit, Ooh, man. you know. That's um, awkward. And, yeah, but it's, you know, if you're doing it in a, a way that's not terrible and you haven't asked someone to, you know, uh, quit their job, you know, we say, hey, this isn't an offer at this point. We're going to see how it goes, um, you know, rather than, you know, have someone put a notice somewhere else. Um, you know, just try to be respectful of people and their time. and um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as far as the management, you know, Jake uh, – does a lot of you know a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff and he's run shops before he's been in you know uh, coffee shops for years and years um he's worked other shops in astoria um and you know he's just really fantastic with people so um one of the things i try to do is stay out of the way 
Okay. You know? So, so do, like, you, do you start with a manager? We did. We Jake? did from day one. Um, uh, yeah, or prior to day one. So he was at another shop that was, um, you know, a few minute walk away that actually ended up closing. Um, he had a little bit of, I think he said it was a two month holiday where he, you know, we, he knew he was going to come here. Uh, he took some time off after, you know, watching that other shop kind of uh, decline uh-huh. and um, was able to start fresh here. That's cool. So he, he's taking on that. And you said you stay you stay out of the way. I <laughs> I attempt to. I don't know if I'm always successful, but, you know, uh, he's, you know, in charge of, you know, quality and making sure, you know, training like I'm not training people on, um, you know, how to uh, pull shots and, you know, uh, what our processes are, you know, here at, uh, at Mighty Oak. Um, you know, that's something that Jake does. We uh, wanted to have a manager from day one just from talking to other small business owners and saying, gosh, I wish I had done that. You know, I waited, thought I was going to wait six months or nine mm-hmm. months. And then I have issues of do I promote from within? And then there's jealousies there. Or do I bring someone else from the outside who doesn't know how we do it the same way? And right, okay. there's that, you know, kind of issues with the staff. So we uh, brought in someone from day one and very glad we took that advice. Yeah. Do you, and some people will do that and then they get the wrong manager. Sure. Like, because, well, I'm leaving this job. It's not working out for me. And you discover later on the reason they left that job is because they are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a little risk there. There is. I mean, well, you know, we know they left his job because the place closed down. So, you know, we yeah, didn't have yeah. to worry about that. And, you know, uh, a lot of friends in common through the neighborhood. So mm. uh, Astoria is very much a community, you know. My uh, my wife pretend you know likes to say that it's like the opening scene in Beauty and the Beast. You know, she can't cross the street without running into five people that she knows and saying oh, hello, man. bonjour, yeah. and all that stuff. Um, so there was friends in common, and um, you know, people we knew that he he did a good job and he was a good person. He he really cares, and it's apparent in you know everything that he does. So I mean, we've you know we've definitely lucked out. We've been really uh, we've worked hard to make sure we have the right people. And, you know, we're lucky in that, that it's worked out. So you work hard to get the right people. And you described the onboarding process and the selection process. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, a little more in detail. Like, what are you looking for? Where What's what's the ideal and what's the, no, we, we, we don't want that? Yeah, um, ideally we want someone who is good with people because, you know, we don't have the necessarily ability or the, you know, the degree in psychology to be able to, you know, make someone uh, or help someone, you know, get through any kind of issues because um, we can teach someone how to make coffee. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it's a, uh, it's demanding and, you know, it, it takes time to become really good at it and to learn the flow and kind of hear the person at the register taking an order and know that you're going to need to start pulling two shots instead of one um, uh, for whatever's going down. But, we want someone who, you know, is going to be friendly. We like some food service experience so we don't have to, like, teach people, like, hey, you need to wash your hands, you know. Um, that kind of stuff uh, that's, you know, they're coming in with some knowledge. You know, I, some of our best uh, baristas were never baristas before. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, again, that's a testament to Jake's training ability uh, and, you know, them being just, like, you know, decent people who like, wanted to be there because they wanted to – be at the shop or they wanted to do something interesting or something unique so when you look at the landscape of people that um, put together hiring regimens a lot of times i think we overthink it we you have a what you just described is way simpler than what you described a minute ago in my mind like you they're good with people um, they have some food service experience but then when you describe um, a questionnaire, phone screening, trial, and all those things, it, it makes me think, wow, that's really complicated. But it's really not. It's it's just you're trying to find those elements in those interactions. Yeah, I mean, you can – I don't want to run my business off of just a gut instinct, you know, that I have about somebody. I want to be able to kind of see – Mm-hmm. Is it, you know, I'll have those instincts and there's, you know, people I talk to on the phone and I go, well, I, I know I'm, I don't need to bring them in. Um, but anyone who takes the time to fill out the application, I, I, uh, I think I've done a phone screen with out of courtesy, just, you know, maybe they're, you know, maybe it doesn't look great on paper, you know, what I'm reading. Um, but I don't want to prejudge if I can. I want to try to, 
you know, limit any kind of biases or, you know, uh, things that, you know, I think might be going on. So, yeah, it's it's simple in that, you know, if I follow these steps and it's working out well for us, but it's not easy or there's not that there's not time involved or uh, work involved going on with that. Yeah. But, you know, you, you, you may talk to someone on the phone and, you know, they may seem great, but they may not be able to interact with customers. And so, you know, you don't see that until you're doing a training shift. And, you know, they could be dismissive to other coworkers or they could be a bar hog or they could, you know, just have some of those habits from other shops that, are, you know, this is the way that's better to do it rather than, hey, this, all right, here I'm in your space and this is how you do it and I'm going to do it that way. Like, Some humility. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a million different ways to make a hamburger. You can put it on the grill and not touch it. You can smash it down. You can put uh, a lid over it. You can put, you know, an iron on top and, keep you know. Keep going, keep going. And going on, that's, that's good. Uh, you, you know, that's, that's all I've got uh, on the spot. <laughs> but, and that doesn't mean any of them is necessarily better than the other way because a lot of it can be preference. But if you're in a place that does it a specific way and mm. you go and want to do it your own way, then there's an issue and it's consistency. You know, that's a very big factor for us is consistency. Um, we use a puck press. We don't uh, do manual tamping. So we don't have to worry about, you know, shots channeling in one way, from one person to the next. I don't ever want, you know, someone to walk into the cafe and see me behind the bar and do a 180 because, my, you know, I pull terrible shots. Um, and also, you know, we use a puck press just also for... Um, uh, repetitive motion injuries and trying to prevent those are so prevalent in the industry. You know, we want to do whatever we can to keep people, you know, safe and healthy. Yeah, that's awesome. Consistency of product and yeah. of experience because, I mean, if, especially when you're just starting out, that first experience that people have with your brand and your employees is is so critical. And I, know, I mentioned this on the show maybe, probably a couple times, and every, maybe it's because every time I get to Coffee Fest, I'm always reminded that this is the case, that the landscape of retail <clears throat> is is so fraught with the, um, what do you call it, just a last-minute uh, mentality toward people. And so a lot of that, like, not a lot of thought goes into who is going to be behind the bar as long as they're available, but a lot of thought goes into the machinery and the carpet or the the tile work and, and things like that. There's no carpet here, just for no the record. Car- yeah, yeah <laughs> just in the bathroom. Tiles. No, no. <laughs> I, I, it's a rare coffee shop that can pull off carpet. Yeah, yeah. I have never seen one. So yeah, I think I, I was there was one in Cincinnati that I saw once. It was, it was kind of cool and eerie. <laughs> so weird <laughs> yeah it's like a library um anyway so it, i'm glad that there's this stringent sort of um you know vetting process for people that represent your brand and it fits it seems with the wood roasting too like you're paying attention to the roast you're paying attention to the people because all of that matters you can't just walk away from the people and expect it to work uh just if you're available work at the bar or if you're uh, putting coffee in the roaster, just let it get hot. It should taste good. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, we, you know, don't, we interview a lot more people than we hire on, you know, and mm-hmm. we bring in more people for interviews than we do trainings with. And we do more trainings with people that, you know, we hire that end up getting hired. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, they're representing, you know, who we are and our brand and the, all the stuff that we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money putting together. So I, to me, it just seems foreign that, I would just hire someone who's available on Tuesdays, you know, if they're not a good fit otherwise. I mean, I, and I, I know they're the realities of that. That's not how everyone else does it, but um, I could never see us doing that. Mm. Well, now that you've got the shop running, the roastery is going and you've got um, regular customers. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what is your or have you developed any plans beyond this initial shop so far? I know it's not technically been a year yet since you've opened, but um, you, you have to have thought about maybe expansion or, you know, a- amping up your wholesale. I know you've got like a growing wholesale uh, business. Yeah, uh, we're growing the wholesale. Um, you know, we launched our e-commerce a few months ago. So we're, you know, uh, selling online as well. Um, we are you know kind of open to seeing what works. Uh, I think the the original idea is, you know, is grow the wholesale 
Mm. Um, maybe one day get a 60 kilo wood fired roaster, get the first one. Um, yeah. just, that would be a cool a space. Tree, just a whole tree in there. Yeah. You just, you know, uh, it'll be nice. Um, so kind of want to see where that goes. So there's, we, we get offers pretty frequently. I, you know, two days ago, someone said, Hey, do you want to, do you want this to be a mighty Oak shop? You know, uh, this cafe. And I said, well, I'm not going to answer <laughs> yes or no right now. Uh, It'd be terrible. Sean comes back from Columbia, and we now have two locations, and he wasn't <laughs> informed. Um, but yeah, so we're you know kind of open to you know where that goes. Um, I think it's the process is so different. Um, there's a lot of places that have multiple shops, and you know I don't know if that would you know be a, a super big differentiator. And it's expensive, you know, opening a shop, uh, especially you know I I would imagine our next one would probably be in Manhattan. Um, mm. and you know, there's a lot of, uh, additional costs of, you know, of doing that. Well, it makes sense. It, it, it seems like, um, the pattern might be to open in a place where it's more affordable to do so. And it makes more sense and you're already there. Sure. And then you, you, you amp up the, uh, everything into the more expensive place, like the, yeah. the hip and the trendy area of your, your town USA. And, uh, is that kind of the thought? Yeah, I mean, well, we opened up where we are because it's where we live. Mm-hmm. You know, I've mm-hmm. been within uh, two blocks of this location for, I think, almost 15 years I've lived here. So um, right now I'm 254 feet away. I can see the shop from my front stoop, um, which is a blessing and a curse. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I just we keep ourselves open to that. You know, I, I'm not going to, just like I said, you know, let the space kind of tell us how it should be laid out. You're kind of let the business, you know, tell us how it should grow. So there could be opportunities to, you know, open other shops or could be, you know, opportunities to, you know, really ramp up the wholesale uh, or have partnerships with, you know, other places. Um, so we're kind of keeping ourselves just, you know, open to see what happens. Okay. And that sounds very... <sighs> frustrating as an answer? <laughs> well, not frustrating as an answer. I'd say it's it's... It is gut level stuff. It's just, it makes me want to ask, what are you looking for? And what would make you say yes? And where are you just like, no, we're not ready. Are there specifics or is it just like, just a feel right now? I mean, we're, it's a feel to some extent. You know, they again, we're just a little over nine months old. And so, you know, we're, the cafe itself is growing. And, you know, I think we had our, busiest week since we've been open and it's beginning of march you know which is seems a little odd from how you know the trends go we had Mm. one of our busiest days was a a, a february you know a a sunday in february it's like that's not normal i don't think but um yeah i just i don't know i don't have a good a good response to that dang it peter (laughs) sir you came all this way and i've left you hanging that's it Uh, No, I I, I get that. And I I don't think I almost feel like if somebody had a really good like step by step process uh, by which they are going to just they're going to follow one, two, three, four, five to expansion, they're going to miss something that is really critical. I mean, I'll say, you know, we didn't uh, launch our e-commerce until Thanksgiving. And we'd been open since May, and that was because the cafe was a lot busier than we had anticipated. And so we needed to make sure that all the processes and procedures were in place, and that the cafe can run itself. And mm-hmm. you know, uh, the the you know, are we ordering appropriately and frequently enough? And uh, you know, it, you know, we're not running out of cups. You know, we never want to be in that position. Um, we didn't want to bite off more than we could chew because, you know, like you said, uh, the qual- you know, if a person's first interaction is going to form what they think about you. We didn't want to set ourselves up for failure or disappointment. We waited to start growing the wholesale, you know, many months after we opened. We had some accounts from day one that, you know, we knew we were going to be supplying, but uh, did not aggressively, you know, push for it uh, for quite a while because we didn't want to set ourselves up for failure. We didn't want to say, yes, we can do this and then, you know, flame out, you know, spectacularly. We wanted to make sure that we were able to grow in a way that we could manage it and sustain it mm-hmm. and put out consistently good product uh, and, you know, great service. And, you know, so I, that's kind of where, you know, it's a gut level. We'll see how it goes. We want to make sure we're ready for that step. Not that, you know, we won't, you're ever really ready to like open a location or any of that kind of stuff. But um, that's kind of where I'm saying, you know, you know how we'll feel it out. 
That's good. Yeah, a lot of a lot of expansion happens right at, at the point where uh, you probably should have stayed open for a year longer to let everything kind of settle in, get the systems down, and then the second shop just kind of has the dysfunction imported into it. Sure. Or the first shop suffers because Always, you spend yeah. all the time on the second one, and uh-huh. it's forget uh, all about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's tragic. Um, so when you consider the you know nine months ago as um you know coffee entrepreneur newly you know the new owner of a coffee shop and you're sitting here now having all this experience um what has changed with you how have you changed uh as as a leader and what challenges are you kind of currently working on in the cafe and, and in your own kind of professional practice um i'll say you know one thing that's always kind of a struggle is forecasting Mm -hmm. you know i can think you know i can try to make a plan out of what uh, a busy day is going to be or you know how how much coffee we're going to need or how much uh, how many pastries i should be ordering and i i just don't have the historical data on that so i can kind of look at what we did last week and how stuff's been trending up or the week before um but i don't know what a you know uh, a tuesday in april is going to look like because I haven't had any days open in April. So for me, that's kind of one of the more difficult things or difficult things. Um, and just, you know, making sure we have the right number of people on uh, a shift. We don't play the like, oh, we're only going to give you four hours. We're going to do this. We do, you know, during the week, it's two people to open, two people to close. So, you know, it's a big space upstairs, you know, for only being a thousand square feet. The bar area is quite big. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff to do. There's a lot of, you know, uh, end of the night stuff, cleaning and things that have to be prepared to, you know, set up for the next day. Um, And so, you know, we don't chase after that. I think I mentioned earlier, we're adjusting our weekend schedule. We had been doing three people opening and two people closing or moving one of those, the third person to like a mid shift uh, because we're staying busier longer uh, into the afternoon on the weekends than we had been previously. So seeing how busy it is. And so we're making, you know, that adjustment. to serve the shop and just so you know that so that the closing baristas aren't like dying from running around you know their entire shift now how are you making that decision is it just feedback from your manager that you're getting i mean look you looking at the numbers i mean you can see oh wow it was just as busy at four o'clock as it was at 11 a.m yeah. but we had the you know the third person only worked until 1 30 so maybe we should adjust that um also feedback directly from the baristas um you know we're try to you know, hey, do you have it? You know, how are things? How was the shift? How was this? Oh, wow. It was so busy. You know, it would be really nice if there was another person instead of just the two of us. Um, you know, it's busy till seven o'clock at night and mm-hmm. we're not able to do any of the cleaning things that we usually start at six or, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, you have to be open to uh, the feedback from the people who are doing the thing because yeah. they're going to know the best. And it impacts your labor, though, when you consider it you know, all the money that you put into this space and you sure. look at the biggest cost that you've got in the in the shop to add another person to a shift or to even just to have from the get-go two and two when yeah. they open and close, that's a big commitment. Yeah, um, we, you know, safety is, and, you know, people are my biggest concern. We didn't want people closing uh, by themselves. You know, it's a, you know, a safe neighborhood, but it's also, it's a city, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, things happen, you know, up the block, you know, there's been stuff and down the block and, you know, whatever. Um, so I didn't ever want to, you know, someone to have to worry about, you know, being alone in a shop at night. Um, but yeah, we, you know, won't, if we were not a roastery, I don't know if we would be open quite as late. We get a lot of people who buy bags of beans for the next morning and they come in, you know, late at night and we're one of those few spaces that's open um, that's not a bar. So you can meet people yeah. and hang out and not have to worry about, you know, drinking. Uh, and so we don't, we don't have any uh, alcohol. We don't serve alcohol here. Um, and it makes it easy. You know, we don't have to worry about those legalities or, you know, that extra stress or, you know, trying to be something else. We, we, we roast coffee with wood. We think that's pretty special. And, you know, we want to showcase that. Um, so that's kind of, you know, where we are as far as, you know, how we approach that type of stuff. I like that. Yeah. It sounds like you've got a real um, a good grasp on 
you know, being connected and empathetic with the people, like you said, that are making it the thing happen. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I don't know if I said this last time, but the way I look at it is that, you know, running a coffee shop is just uh, another vehicle for you know customer service. You know, we could be a mattress store, and I'd still want people to be friendly and you know welcoming to whoever comes in. Um, we're not a mattress store, thank God. <laughs> you know, uh, that would be really weird, and I'd be on the <laughs> complete wrong podcast. Um, but yeah, it, we're nothing without the people, and I, you know, I, I, I honestly, firmly believe that. Um, you know, they are the lifeblood, and so I have to make sure I'm doing right by them. Um, I want them to be happy. I don't, you know, we're very flexible with scheduling as far as if you need a day off, like you know, hey, request it off before we put out the schedule, or if you need to do swaps, like that's cool. Um, we want you to want to be here. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get the same level or the same, you know, uh, care if by someone who's like, man, I didn't want to be here and I didn't get the day off and screw this place and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like, we want you to be here. It's a, you know, a fun shop. We have good interaction with our customers and, um, you know, it's important for baristas to be happy. Absolutely is. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like you're pretty happy too. Some days. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I, uh, again, I told you this in person, but I'm in awe of what you've created here. Uh, seeing it on Instagram is great. Um, but doing this IRL, you know, yeah. and stepping foot on the awesome tile work uh, is really, really cool. It's a great feel. And you've created something very special, you and Sean. Um, what would you say, and kind of my final question, um, what would you say is your number one advice to somebody who would be in your position, uh, they're just starting to consider opening a coffee bar, or maybe they're in the build out phase. It's yourself back in the time where I interviewed yeah. you, like talk to Don't that person. Don't do it. No, no. No, away. <laughs> no I, I probably made this joke the last time, you know, have a lot of money. That's uh, solves a lot of those problems. Mm. Um, you know, if you can do that, <laughs> I would definitely recommend it. Um, but, man talk to other people you know there's so many people who are going to know so many more things than you and people love to talk about things that they know about and it excites them so use that and you know learn just ask people go to you know coffee fest talk to people say hello walk up to that stranger and you heard them say something inter interesting and you know see what it's about and you know uh make those relationships I mean, that's that's my biggest advice there's there's so much knowledge out there don't let it go to waste. And yeah, I agree. As, as someone who's done so many interviews, and I'm I'm just constantly su surprised and pleasantly surprised at how many people are just like, yes, let's talk about this thing, and we don't get to really talk about. We're we're working. Yeah, you know, we're not talking about this stuff when we're not doing podcasts no. or having conversations. And it's so it's mostly cookbooks. Outlet. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Peter, this has been really fun. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, spending some time here over the uh, Coffee Fest in New York. Yeah. Um, and again, congrats. This is a beautiful space. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk about it a bit. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I'll say one other lesson. I, you know, I tell people to listen to your podcast. I know uh, I kind of freaked you out when I told you I listened to all of the episodes right. sequentially. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think you kind of busted my chops a little bit. But uh, I, it was very helpful for me because I couldn't self-select episodes that I thought were interesting. So I learned things from episodes that I wouldn't have listened to if I hadn't forced myself to do that. And, you know, some of the, other, some of those things were, you know, really great. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, it's been a big help for us. I talk about your podcast and, um, you know, I recommend anyone who's, you know, kind of looking to go into this to go, you know, listen to what people are saying, you know, you're going to learn and it's going to make you better at what you do and what you're trying to put out. Amazing. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation. I know for me, one of the highlights was just how much they rely on having good communication and feedback from the staff and those around them. So from the design phase, you know, always, you know, showing their plans and designs for the bar to friends and people that they respected and were authorities in, in certain areas they were seeking feedback in that way. And they're also seeking and feedback from the staff even now as they're operating the shop. So obviously 
um, having great communication and uh, making sure that there is a mechanism for feedback is a very important value for Mighty Oak Roasters. And I'll tell you that their coffee is amazing. Um, and I really respect what they're doing for sustainability with their wood fire uh, setup. It is truly progressive when it comes to roasting operations. And so um, thank you so much, Peter, for your hospitality, for um, welcoming me to Astoria at your shop and for being on the show, sharing your story with, uh, with us at Keys to the Shop. We really appreciate you and wish you all the best as you continue to operate the roasting during this time. Now, if you want to learn more, you can go to their website, mightyoakroasters.com, and you'll find out all the information you need to know. You should also follow them on Instagram under the same handle, Mighty Oak Roasters. Now, if you want to reach out to me directly with any questions, comments, or feedback, you can do so by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. I would love to hear from you. Um, as a reminder, if you didn't hear on the last episode that um, I have drastically reduced the rates of over the phone consultation so that it's more available to you if you would like to do something like that for your company, especially now, um, through this show and through uh, the consulting, I really want to be able to help as many people as possible. So if that's interesting to you, if you want to explore what that uh, looks like for your organization, for yourself email me also chris at keys to the shop.com thank you so much for joining me on another founder friday from keys to the shop i appreciate all of you um, keep on fighting we are in this together and i hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop <laughs>